So I come from a small biotech company in upstate New York where we have assembled a team to truly challenge our societal addiction to the plastics and foams that are poisoning our planet. Today I'll describe how we got started by literally growing a drop-in replacement for the plastic foams used in the protective packaging space and where we see the next major environmental burden in electronic waste. Traditional synthetic manufacturing systems are highly reliant upon high embodied energy processes and finite resources such as fossil fuels. We know that this is not sustainable for our planet, nor is it sustainable for business. This is why at Ecovative, we've truly begun to look to nature to grow, not manufacture, the next generation of high performance, low cost materials. When you're looking at the phylogenetic tree, it's pretty easy to see that there are over 50 million species of known life on our planet. Each of these organisms has adapted to its surrounding environment by generating its own material platform. This ranges from the thermophilic bacteria that you might find growing in steam vents along the ocean floor, but to even microscopic animals that can survive the vacuums of space. But today at Ecovative, we're really focused on the kingdom of Eumycota, or fungi. When most think of fungi, they'd envision a mushroom growing on the side of a tree, or perhaps even served up on a dinner plate. But common household molds, such as this fuzzy critter right here, also fall into this kingdom. Now, although these two phyla of fungi look quite different with the naked eye, they do share a common denominator when you look at them under a microscope. They have the same vegetative tissue known as mycelium. This vast network of unicellular strands is responsible for all of the nutrition transportation and signaling within the fungus, as well as giving it all of its strength and structure. This is why today we have leveraged the tenacious strength of fungal mycelium as a natural adhesive, growing on and binding to agricultural byproducts, real waste streams from farms. It'll bind these products together to produce a drop in replacement for the plastic foams that you traditionally find in protective packaging and, of course, in construction materials. Now, fungi today really do lend themselves quite nicely to industrial processes. The reason for this is because they grow exceptionally fast, exponentially, actually. So as I start this time-lapse video, which takes place over the course of just five days, what you'll see is the white fungal mycelium start to proliferate and grow out. All energy that's required for the growth comes from that agricultural waste, from the carbohydrates that reside within it. This process is literally self-assembling, doesn't require any human interaction, and occurs in the dark, indoors, and without any accelerated temperatures. But the versatility of fungi goes beyond just the types of garbage that they'll grow on. But it includes even the toxic wastes that will grow in the presence of. And for this, we have to leave the farm and go to our nation's largest Superfund site. The Berkeley Pit Mine in Butte, Montana was actually a mountain before it was a lake, until the top of it was blown off in the 1940s in order to easily access precious metals, such as gold and copper. This was all well and good until that mine was abandoned, and a natural spring below started to fill it up with water, carrying it with it a number of metals from the surrounding ore. This included, of course, iron, which was found in its most primitive form in pyrite. When mixed with water and oxygen, this quickly turned into sulfuric acid, creating an environment within the lake that would even kill E. coli in just 30 seconds. That's why it was really impressive when researchers found fungi as among the 60 species of life residing and growing in the Berkeley pit. Now, fungi are really unique for this capability, and they developed a number of methods in order to account for and grow around metal toxins. Mushroom species, like the picture I put up earlier, they'll actually create complex proteins known as chelators. These proteins will actually bind to active sites and allow the fungus to store that ion, which was once a free radical, safely into the cell. But common household molds, like this guy here, have adapted a different methodology in which they will accumulate or sequester the metals in their environments right onto the exterior of their cell wall. Pretty interesting. This stuff's called biosorption and has a really interesting physiological implication. So we have the same fungus. The one on the top here was grown on standard potato media. 
And something that's really easy to see from this picture that was taken under a microscope is that it produces a lot of spores. Spores are human allergen concerns and are not great for industrial processes, especially for consumer-facing products. But when you grow the same fungus on potato media again, which is on the bottom now, and heighten the, uh, the concentration of the copper within the solution, what you'll find is first, it doesn't produce any spores, and second, it'll sequester up to 80% of the metal ion within the solution, right onto the cell wall. This is pretty interesting, because if you look at standard mycelium, I mean, take a really close look at mycelium, what you'll find is that it's comprised of the biopolymer chitin. Chitin is the second most abundant biopolymer on our planet, following only cellulose. And the reason for this is that it's not only found in fungi, but it's also found in lots of standard arthropods, like our friends the crabs. Now, the last time you've probably had a crab and you felt its shell, you can realize that this material is really rigid and robust. Of course, it's water and soluble, but another key characteristic of chitin is that it's also a great electrical insulator. So, for example, if you were to take a piece of our standard fungal mycelium, plug it into a three-volt source, such as these D batteries, you'll measure a really significant voltage drop across that material, because it's not conductive. But if you were to take the same fungus, grow it on wastewater from a Superfund site that has copper in it, for example, what you'll find is that now it becomes highly conductive. And that conductivity ranges depending on the amount of metal that's in the solution. So now what you're left with is a biological resistor, or a mushroom circuit. <laughs> so today, when we're growing mushroom circuits, our masters of mycelium in our fermentation laboratory will take wastewater from a Superfund site that has a metal species of interest, traditionally copper. They'll mix it with agricultural waste from a local farm to serve as a nutrition source and grow out large volumes of the fungal tissue. It's then passed off to our mad scientists and our applied chemistry team. <laughs> and there they'll dry out the material as well as plasticize it, making it really elastic and no longer brittle. It's the perfect point to pass it off to our designers in our fabrication laboratory who will cut or etch the circuit pattern that's required for any particular application. And at that point, it's really just plug and play. You add your battery pack, plug in an LED, and of course, you have to turn off the lights. But once you do that, you're left with your first battery-powered mushroom flashlight. <laughs> so this is really cool, because now we can go from a super fun site to a farm by mixing agricultural waste streams with water that's contaminated with heavy metals. We can literally grow a biological circuit. And of course, the co-product here is remediated or cleaned water. But what's really interesting, and the story doesn't end quite there, is that this process can continue. At the end of that useful life cycle for that circuit, it can go right back into our fermentation process. The mycelium becomes more nutrition for more mycelium, and the copper is then passed along to be a conductive agent in a new circuit. Now, our planet has been fa facing the devastating consequences of our plastic waste for a little over a century now. We've seen the consequences, of course, in places such as the Pacific Gyre. But what's not well known to many Americans and out of sight and out of mind for most is what happens with our electronic waste. Many of us save up our old phones and computer monitors, and we might bring them to recycling facilities. But most often than not, these materials are not processed within the US, but rather they're crated up and shipped overseas to developing nations, where they're worked with in unsafe conditions, and many of those metals are aerosolized, once again becoming environmental pollutants. That's why at Ecovative, we think it's absolutely paramount that like all materials, all of our electronics and circuits fit into nature's recycling system. Thanks. <laughs>